The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Welcome to Meet the Author. I'm your host, Matt Fetters. Joining me in the studio today is award-winning author, Cynthia Cato Hada. Welcome, Cynthia. Hi, nice to meet you. I, I met you earlier. But exactly. Nice it's great to, to have you here. here. We're excited to talk to you today. We're also excited that joining us via Skype are students from Rocky Run Middle School. Hello, Rocky Run. Hi. All right. <laughs> We're looking forward to hearing your questions a little bit later. You guys, we'll get back to you in just a second. Cynthia has written over a dozen books, and her titles include Newbery winner Kira Kira, National Book Award winner The Thing About Luck, her, th her 2018 release Checked, and coming to bookstores soon is her latest novel A Place to Belong. Uh, one thing I want to share with you, which I hadn't shared yet, we were talking about my dog. Well, mm -hmm. my dog literally devoured, <laughs> devoured this book. And you gotta promise me, but before you leave, you gotta tell, tell me what happened in chapters. Oh my gosh, that's chapters hilarious. Chapters 35 <laughs> through 38, okay? Is that a deal? Yes, that's okay, definitely great. a deal. That's hilarious. Jenkins though. loved it. Jenkins approved. There's a line in a book I'm reading. It says, I'm a bad dog. I No, it says, I did a bad thing, but I'm not a bad dog. So. <laughs> my dog would agree. Like, um, and all those titles and all those awards what was it like to win the Newberry? The Newberry was incredibly exciting. So it was 4.26 in the morning, the phone rang, and uh, it was Susan Faust who said, you've won the Newberry, or you're, you're, she, I think she said, your book is going to be wearing gold now, meaning the gold right, sticker. Right, right. And I said, Wah! and I screamed. <laughs> and my son was a baby, he woke up, and the dog woke up and I have pictures of me standing in a robe in my glasses and they're both there like, what is going on? And I was screaming. <laughs> Did you um, ever imagine that you'd win not only Newberry but all these other awards? No, no, you just, you, all you want is to be published again. That's I think pretty much always been my goal. Right, so. and did you always want to be an author? Not really. I think when I was more maybe in high school and 17, 18 in there, I wanted to write nonfiction. And then in my 20s, I started feeling like I wanted to write fiction. Mm -hmm. All right. Our students out at Rocky Run are eagerly awaiting to ask you some questions. So let's go back out to those guys out at Rocky Run. All right, Rocky Run, who has the first question? Fire away. Hi, my name is Prisha. You've written books in multiple genres like Checked, which is sports fiction, and Kira Kira, which is historical fiction. What makes you want to write in books in different genres? Uh, really, I just, I either get on the internet or I go through things in my life and something just pops into my head that I really care about. And so it's not really wanting to write in different genres, it's just some things out there in, in the world that, that makes me feel passionate and that's what I want to write about, whatever I just really care about. Does the genre ever change once you start to get going and go, well, you know, maybe I'll make this one be a sports book instead. Does that ever happen? Not really. It changes a lot just because my editor, uh, I was telling you earlier, right. she slashes through entire pages. She uses green pen. I think she might use different colors with different authors, right. but with me, she uses green pen, and so she slashes through things. And sometimes, which is devastating, she'll say, yeah, I think you need to work on something else for a while. So. <laughs> okay, Rocky Run, another question from you guys. Fire away. Okay, so hi, my name is Purnima, and my question is, does the word Kira Kira hold the same meaning or importance to you as it did to Katie and Lynn? It holds importance to me a lot, but not in the same way as it does to them. Uh, the, the original word, I originally called the book Pika Pika, which also means shining in Japanese, but then a friend of mine who has spent a lot of time in Japan said that there was some kind of toilet cleaner commercial and they described the toilet bowl after you used this cleaner 
as being Pika Pika and that it was a bad association. So I changed it then to, to Kira Kira. And it means a lot to me just because it's the name of my first kid's book and because it won the Newberry. But I, and I, and I believe in what the kids believe, which is that, you know, it's just, there, there is so much that shines and is wonderful in the world as well as bad things for sure. But so, so it means a lot to me, but not quite probably in the same way as it does to those kids because they, you know, they grew up with these feelings and I really didn't. Two more questions right now from uh, you guys out at Rocky Run. Go ahead with the next question. Hi, I'm Bonnie. I was wondering, in Kira Kira, did you incorporate something that happened to you in real life? I did. I did a lot just because that year I had my first dog that I ever had as a grown up. Her name was Sarah. And she was such an insane dog when I got her. She used to jump up and kind of nip at my forehead. I'd have little bits of of blood on my forehead and <laughs> she was nuts. I was terrified of her, <laughs> but I kept her. And within a few months, I just loved this dog so much. And she started getting sick where she would get sick and she would get better and she would get sick and she would get better. And she actually died while I was writing the book. And a good friend of mine told me to write down everything that I was feeling about this dog right then. And so I wrote down everything and some of it I used verbatim in the book because I was just so sad. I, that's the saddest I've ever been in my life. So I used that a lot in the book. All right, one more question from Rocky Run. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Ella. Um, I was wondering again, same book, Kira Kira. Which character do you see yourself most in? Do you see yourself more as Katie or Lynn? I for sure see myself most as Katie. In fact, that was a book where I was really kind of I felt like it was me almost as I was writing it. A lot of books I write and I'm, I, you have to kind of travel somewhere in your head to become the character, but that book I didn't really have to do that. It was very natural. Uh, I think that book took less than a year to write. I have books that take years to write, but that one, it just felt like me and it was very easy, not easy, but it, was, uh, it came out much more quickly than other books. All right, great questions, Rocky Run. We'll get back to you guys just a little bit later in the show. Do you have a question for Cynthia Cato Hada? Join the conversation and give us a call. We welcome your phone calls and your tweets. That information is on the screen right there. So your latest novel, A Place to Belong, mm -hmm. historical fiction, kind of set, the, set it up for us, would you? Well, so during World War II, uh, of course, the Japanese were, they were incarcerated, incarcerated in camps. And what they did was while they were in camps, they had them fill out these questionnaires. And the questionnaires asked two questions. They're called question 27 and 28. I think it's 27 and 28. Mm -hmm. And it was trying to determine the loyalty of the people who were incarcerated. And if you sort of answered these questions, yes, yes, and the questions were, are you willing to serve in the armed forces? That was one of the questions. And if you answered them, yes, yes, you were considered loyal and then they could draft you. But if you answered something like, well, I'll serve in the armed forces if, you're, if you give my family back their civil rights, that was considered um, the wrong answer. And you were basically brought in to an office, I assume, and, and you were interviewed and if the interview didn't go well, you were called a no-no boy. And you were put into this camp called Tule Lake. And some of these people, Tule Lake was a very intense, kind of crazy environment. And some of these people ended up renouncing their citizenship. Mm -hmm. They, um, the government changed the rules, the laws basically, so that they could renounce their citizenship. And some of them were basically deported to Japan, and that's what happens to my character. Right. Uh, we're seeing photographs now from Thule Lake. Um, also in A Place to Belong, you dedicate it to Wayne Collins. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us who he is and what he accomplished. I, I tell kids sometimes when I talk to them, I thought he was one of the bravest men in America. He, um, he worked tirelessly and sometimes without pay in order to help these people who had renounced get their citizenship back. Mm -hmm. And so he spent many, many hours. He, he originally wanted to do a class action suit, which is where everybody gets their citizenship back at once. Right. 
and a ju one judge said it was okay and another judge said no. And so he had to individually get the citizenship back for thousands of people and and he and he did it and anyone who wanted to come back was able to come back. It took it took a decade, more than a decade for some, wow. a couple of decades for some. How is there not a movie about this? Guy, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, as we talk about these camps, it's interesting, they, various names, right? They call them internment camps, relocation camps, separation camps. Uh -huh. What do you make of that? Well, it's just the times change, I think. So I had said internment at one point in the book, and I had somebody read the book for me who's very knowledgeable about everything to do with the camps. Mm -hmm. And he says nobody really uses, or they don't, nobody really uses that that much anymore. And so not to use that word, he encouraged me not to use that word. So right. I used, I tried to use more like incarceration uh -huh. and things like that. Huh. Um, these photographs we've been seeing uh, are great primary sources, great primary mm -hmm. documents, and we've done handful of shows here at the Fairfax Network teaching teachers how to use primary sources. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how you use primary sources in your research for these books. Well, I interview a lot of people, not a lot, I try to interview as many as I can who will, uh, who actually went through the experience. So I, that's the main source mm -hmm. of, um, you know, of this book for sure. And also I love looking at old pictures. I, it's just, it's so invigorating to me as a writer to see these old pictures. Um, there's some, someone took some pictures, I think it was in Tule Lake, that they used Kodachrome, so they're actually in color. Oh wow. And they really come to life for you, so. Uh, and you had a very personal primary source. Your father was in one of these camps, right? Uh, my father was in the Poston camp, yes. And he, in fact, was, he was not a no-no boy and he was drafted and he actually ended up serving. He didn't see action. He served as an interpreter in Japan. Right. Uh, did he talk much about his time in the camps or his service in the war? No, right? no. He didn't like to generation. talk about it. Yes, yeah. he didn't like to talk about it. So I think more and more people are willing to talk about it. And I've been lucky. Uh, it can always, you can always, it's almost like magic. Suddenly these people appear in your life and they're willing to talk about you, yeah, yeah. these things. So. Um, and speaking of your family, the uh, family is a prominent theme in a lot of your books. Mm -hmm. why, why does that resonate with you? I, they were just such a big part of my life growing up. I think we lived in Arkansas as, as a child, as I mentioned earlier, and uh -huh. I just, it was just, there was, there was nothing but your family. It was all your family. You were with them constantly. And when I interview people, older people, about their lives back then, they talk constantly about their families. So you say, what was the, what was, what was it like living in the camps? Well, my dad thought that, or my mom thought that, uh -huh, you know, so uh -huh. it's very much about their families. Interesting. All right, we have an email question for you. Uh, this one is from Katie, and she writes, why are both little brothers in Kira Kira and A Place to Belong so quirky? That I have no idea because my, uh, my brother is not that quirky. I mean, he's everybody's a little quirky, right, all people are, right. but he's not that quirky. And yet, and I think of him when I'm writing, and I think the quirkiness comes from the fact that, to me, my brother is because he was a baby, and you know, we changed his diaper, so he's very vulnerable to me. He's not like that, but right. to me, he's very vulnerable. And so, I think I make them kind of quirky because I like their vulnerability. Um, and speaking of the characters in your books, talk to us a little bit about how you go about developing the characters. The characters, a lot of it comes from talking to people, like with The Place to Belong, I first started it in 2006, and it took forever because I just couldn't find the character. And I suddenly met this woman who had lived through that, who had, who her father was a some kind of vegetable worker, he worked uh -huh. with produce, and they were sent to Japan on this ship, and she lived with her grandparents who lavished love and affection on her, and all of a sudden everything clicked. So it was really meeting her that just changed the whole progress of the book. I was floundering, and then all of a sudden I met her, and she was like magic for oh, me. Oh, well, great. 
Um, and when you do these interviews, what do you record them? Like a t like a wouldn't be a tape recorder now, but a you know an audio recorder, or do you videotape them? What do you how do you do it? I take notes. Uh -huh. I take really really messy notes, and then I type <laughs> up the notes. <laughs> I have recorded people before, but the problem with that is, it's kind of tedious to transcribe them. And I had a, a what is it called a dicta thing where you press Dictaphone, your foot. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got pretty good at that actually. Right, right. But some tapes I actually never end up transcribing because there's just so many of them. Right. So it's easier for me with, uh, you know, with handwriting, I think. Right, right. That's good. Okay, time to go back out to Rocky Run. I think they've got some more questions for us. Hopefully they are lined up to fire away. Go ahead, Rocky Run. Hi, my name is Sherry, and I was wondering how do you incorporate foreshadowing in your writing? Hi, Sherry. Um, I'm not a very technical writer. I think I'm more of an instinctive writer, so I don't really think in those terms necessarily about foreshadowing. Uh, I think more just uh, what is instinctive, I think, and I, and, and I just put it down there on the paper. So sometimes my editor will uh, talk in more technical terms and the copy editors as well, and then I'll insert something at their suggestion. But in terms of how I just sit down and write in front of my computer, that's not something I think about that much. Does that make sense? Uh, can you give us an example of one of your books that played out that way, the way you were just describing? I think all of them. <laughs> <laughs> she, I talk about my editor a lot because right. she's a big part of the process. And uh, so everything I, I write, uh, except for Kira Kira, really, she, I, I write it and then she just slashes through everything in green pen and um, we argue. She doesn't argue, I do all the arguing. And so I, I have to change a lot. Um, I don't always do what she says and she doesn't always say specific things you should do, but she will say, you know, she'll cross things out, this isn't working and you know, if she if she mentions something more technical, then then I do have to think about it in a more um, rational fashion. And just tell, tell us a little bit more. We were talking before about your editor and the relationship you have with her, and that you've known her for a long time, mm -hmm. and there's lots of trust there. Mm -hmm. Just tell us a little bit about that relationship. I do. I, I I'd have to say she's one of the handful of people in my life I just have total trust of. I would trust her with anything. She's, uh, she was my roommate in grad school and she's just always been, she's a wonderful person yeah. and, and I apologize for all the times <laughs> I get mad at her and I <laughs> yell at her <laughs> because she's really a wonderful person. And in, in a sense, I can act the way I act with her because I do have so much trust of her. Right. Like if I trusted her less, I would probably be much better behaved. <laughs> <laughs> like we all do with yeah. our friends, right? Uh, let's go back out to Rocky Run for another question. Um, hi, my name is Bella, and my question is, how do you decide the topics you write about? How do I decide the topics I write about? It's just stuff that's in my life that I love uh, and that I'm interested in. You know, my son play, he doesn't like me to talk about him, but he does play ice hockey, so I'm at the rink a lot. <laughs> And so I know a lot about kids playing hockey. And so that was something I just, I had to write about. It's a huge part of my life. And, you know, the camps, that was a big part of my life just because my dad was in a camp. And um, I wanted to, like with a place to belong, I wanted to write about another aspect of the camps. So in Weed Flower, I wrote about the people who were sort of yes, yes. And in A Place to Belong, I also wanted to write about the, boy, the people who were no-no boys. So it's just really stuff that invades my life and it, it's in my brain and I can't get it out and I have to write about it. Uh, back out to Rocky Run for another question. Hi, my name is Margo and I, my question is, what would you say is the hardest part about writing a book? The hardest part about writing a book I'm very, um, I read something many years ago and it said, when you're writing, make a mess and then clean it up. And so when I first start writing, I just throw it all on the page. And that is, that part is almost the easy part. 
And then it's really, again, mentioning my editor when she comes in and says, what have you done? That's probably the hardest part. And another hard part, I think, is just finding, finding that, that magic. Like sometimes you're writing and you're just not in the zone. You know how they say athletes get in the zone and they just know how to hit a baseball or whatever. You have to be in the zone. And I think finding that zone, you're listening to music, it's the right time of day. And that is probably uh, one of the hardest parts. Once you're in there, then the writing starts to flow. But I think getting in that zone for me can be really hard. Uh, one more from Rocky Run this time around. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Bella, and I really like checks. But uh, what made you tie cancer to um, hockey? I'm not sure what made me tie cancer to hockey. I wanted. I wanted um, him, the boy, to have something in his life that was very distracting from, from the hockey and that I wanted it to be really important to him. So he had to think about what is my life about, what, what gives my life meaning, what is, you know, what is my biggest priority. And so I, wanted, I just wanted him to, ha him to have these challenges in his life. So I wanted something that was very important to him. And because I have a Doberman as well, I just naturally threw the Doberman in. I threw a Doberman into, uh, what book was that? The thing about luck, I threw a Doberman in there too. So <laughs> I just throw Dobermans in all my books. <laughs> <laughs> Your lucky charm, right? <laughs> Great questions, Rocky Ron. We'll get back to you guys in a little bit. Um, so you talked a little bit about your process and how you just kind of throw things out there. Mm -hmm. let's, let's go to the end. Do you ever know how it's gonna end before you get going? No, I never know how it's going to end. Sometimes I'll write up the ending, but it never ends up being the ending. So that's, that happens in the process of writing. Right. Um, let's go to another email question I think we have here for you. This one is from Megan, and she writes, I like how you write about strong female characters who don't seem to fit in. Is this something you've experienced? Hmm. I hope I'm a strong female character in my life, for sure. And I think we all feel at times that we don't fit in, especially when you're growing up, you feel like uh, nobody understands you at moments. So part of that, for sure, is from, is from real life. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I, you know, I had friends and I, 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 I felt, I had fun. For sure, I had fun growing up. So I don't know why that uh, I have them not fit in. <laughs> Maybe just to give some drama into their lives. Right, right. But uh, the strong female characters, I think that's really important. You, when you write a book, you want the character to have a certain type of strength and you know passion in their lives. So uh, when you talk about writing in drama into the story, how do you know if enough is enough? Do you ever get like, oh, I gotta dial this back a little bit. That, that's too much. I, that, that would be my editor's job for <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, when, and also when you're starting, do you use an outline at all? Do you kind of structure things out that way before you get going? I used to. With Kira Kira, I did write an outline. And as computers just sort of took over the lives of all of us, I started just writing it more on the computer and. Uh, and just letting it all come out. Right. But I used to always outline. I used to write everything by longhand first. So. Wow. Um, and when you're talking about being in the zone, what, what, are the, what are your settings for getting yourself into that zone? Like, do you have a favorite chair? Do you have a favorite time of day? Do you have, a, have to have a glass of something, you know? I like, uh, I like night better. Uh -huh. I like, you know, my three bottles of water or whatever. Right, I drink a right, lot of water right. and I have, Ear, earbuds in and I listen to music. I used to not have earbuds and then when I lived in apartments, people would be banging on the floor saying, basically telling me to turn down the music. So. What type of music do you listen to? Well, I like Bruce Springsteen. Uh -huh, I, uh -huh. like, I like Motown a lot. Right. And I like um, some of Bob Dylan's song, uh, songs I like a right, lot. Right. So Amy Winehouse, I like a lot. Yeah, very good, very good. Okay, uh, one more time out to Cub Run. I think they have about three more questions for us. Well, excuse me, Rocky Run. Confusing my schools here. Rocky Run, <laughs> go ahead. Hello, my name is Bonnie. I wanted to know that if you could ask your, if you could tell your younger writing self anything, what would it be? My younger writing self, I think I was always 
worried about getting published, and that's probably a bad way to go about it. I, at, at some point, I did realize that the most important thing is trying to make yourself a better writer. So I think I would just say, don't worry about getting published. Worry about trying to make yourself a better writer. Great answer. Back out, well, another question. Hi, it's me, Prisha, again. What kind of challenges have you come across when researching to write a book? Uh, the, the biggest challenge with, for instance, a place to belong was just finding people to talk to. Um, I think a lot of the families who came from no-no boy families, there was a stigma to being a no-no boy and there was definitely some strife between those who were and th those who weren't. And so some of them did not want to talk and it was hard to find people to talk to. There was another very elderly man. He, um, I think he might have been in his 90s. And he wrote this paper and he said, I'm going to show you this paper, but don't show it to anybody. This is about my experiences. And he was terrified. He thought that the FBI could come after him if they read this paper. And honestly, I read it and it was very mild and it was very non-controversial. But so there's also this almost fear with some of them. I think that's probably uh, been a big challenge. Um, along with the challenges and all the things you learn while you write a book, what are some of the most surprising things that you've learned while you write books? The most surprising things I think the most surprising thing over time has been the way it just suddenly clicks. Like the, it, whenever it happens, it's a shock because you've been struggling uh -huh. and then all of a sudden it's there, so. Is, are you ever surprised when it doesn't click? Like, like do you come to depend on, well, I, I know yeah. it's gonna click here sooner or later, yeah. so, so I'll keep plodding along. That's a great question, you do. You think, you think uh, yeah, it's, it's all gonna work out, it's all gonna work out. And then there definitely was one book where it never worked out. Two books, I think. It just never worked out. Right. But yeah, you, that does surprise you a lot because you expect it to happen. Yeah. And do you, do you experience the, the stereotypical writer's block? Uh, no. I mean, some, yeah, I, I would say sometimes I do where I just don't. It's more like I'm, it's a laziness block kind uh -huh. of. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I just feel like, yeah, I don't feel like getting on my computer. And so... It's, yeah, it's more, it feels more like laziness than not just, than a block where I really can't just right. access the, right. whatever the magic or whatever. Uh -huh, so. uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, one last question out there to Rocky Run Fireway. Hi, I'm Ella again. So I, my question is, what suggestions do you have for aspiring authors or just students trying to improve at their writing? What suggestions do I have? I think, you know, it's interesting, you have to balance almost this feeling of complete freedom, so just be free. At the same time, you have to have a lot of discipline. So I think finding that balance is the most important thing, that there are times when you just have to let yourself go and be free and to write what's in your heart, but there are other times when you have to be very disciplined and think about what's working and what's not, and think about what other writers have done and how that worked and why that worked. So I, th I think just, just maybe finding the balance for you is, is um, it's, it's probably the most important thing for me. And All right, great answer. Rocky, Ron, you guys did a great job out there today. Thank you so much for all your questions. Thank you. You guys are a big part of the show, thanks. And Cynthia, thank you for being here today. It was thank a lot of you. fun talking to you. It was fun. All right. If you'd like to learn more about Cynthia Kedahata, visit her website. To learn more about our upcoming programs, visit the Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Matt Fetters. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. Thanks for watching.